prepare to put on your tinfoil hats. Okay, how's everyone doing tonight? So tonight is going to be different than our general topic. We are going to have Kayon, who is a archaeologist from Australia. And she has some hypotheses about a number of topics, tales of flying snakes and things along those lines, and get her thoughts on what she thinks that uh, these may have been, or just, just kind of dive into the deep details with her. So uh, welcome to the show, Kay. How's it going? Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no worries. So uh, why don't you go ahead and start off with just a little bit about yourself um, and tell us what you're working on. What, you, what are your... Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, sure. So, um, as mentioned, my name is Kay. Um, I'm an archaeologist from Australia. Um, I specialize in Egyptian archaeology. Um, so, yeah, I've done quite a bit of work in Egyptian tombs, um, Egyptian fairy tales, uh, all sorts. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Right on. Very cool. So, how did... I remember we've been talking. We've been talking off the air for probably like, oh wow, it's been an hour. Uh, so we've uh, we talked quite a bit off the <laughs> air about a number of different things, and I'm curious to what what is it that drew your attention to the main thing that we wanted to talk about tonight? Uh, sure. So um, basically, what we've been discussing off air is um, there's a site in Egypt known as Wadi El Hitan, or which translates basically to Valley of the Whales. Uh, and it's known as this because there are a bunch of ancient whale skeletons from the Eocene. Uh, and some of them are particularly interesting because they feature like legs, um, not legs that are usable, but you know. Um, and the reason I found this site interesting is because I thought, well, obviously these skeletons were there when the Egyptians were there. So what did they think of it or anything like that? Um, so my research began on this topic. Um, I started looking for any mention of, um, like, you know, like anything to do with fossils or skeletons or anything like this. And I stumbled across some um, Herodotus, who um, a lot of people would probably know is a very famous Greek philosopher, historian. He wrote a very famous series called The Histories, which we take a lot of knowledge from. Um, because of this uh, book, he's often known as either the father of history or the father of lies, depending on who you speak to. A lot of Egyptian archaeologists call him the father of lies, um, mostly because of what he says about things in Egypt. So uh, one of these things is he mentions um, the backbones and ribs of serpents in such numbers as it is impossible to describe within Egypt's borders. And uh, he claims that they belonged to wing winged serpents that flew towards Egypt in every spring, uh, but they were preventing, prevented from entering the country by the ibis. Um, so I thought this was very interesting because if you look up pictures of the whale skeletons from Wadi El Hitan, uh, they very much look like giant snakes. Um, you know, there's, they don't really show signs of flippers. Um, some of them have these little legs, which, you know, I suppose you could say they look like the sprouting of wings or something. But um, without the knowledge of science and evolution and all that sort of thing, I can sort of see how someone might see all these giant skeletons and think, oh, well, they're obviously giant snakes, but how did they get here? There's no, you know, um, trails in the sands like snakes make. Oh, they must have flew and fallen from the sky when they died. So this is kind of the thing I've been researching and having to look at a little bit. Very cool. That's very interesting. I, I love, um, you know, it really makes me wonder uh, a lot of these older civilizations, like what they would think discovering large bones and large fossils. I know that in certain, <laughs> you know, like if, if you were to discover, you know, stuff in the tar pits and stuff, it was, they, they wouldn't know mm -hmm. how to assemble them. There, there's, there's just no way they'd be able to piece mm. it together without some deeper understanding of sciences. So my question to you is how did they or how did this individual come to find these fossils and were they in a way that he could interpret them in a certain way or were they scattered random? What, 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 what do you think his, uh, his encounters would have been with these bones? Or excuse me, I guess I shouldn't uh, say they're bones. If, if they're fossils, technically they're, they're <laughs> mineralized. I don't have to get into all that, but 
for for any <laughs> any uh you know archaeologists or uh paleontologists that listen to us uh, i make want to make sure that i'm being proper here but please continue <laughs> um this is actually uh, it's a good question and it's also very hard to answer because all i've got from herodotus is what he's written in his histories you know so i i don't know i don't even know if what i've just described is what he saw it's just something that makes sense you know um like there's a chance that he just completely made it up i'm kind of giving him the benefit of the doubt <laughs> right so you're you're thinking maybe he did see something misinterpreted it and that's what these stories are based off of yeah like i find it difficult to think that you know he's written the histories as ex- exactly what it says you know it's a book of histories so it doesn't make sense to me that he would completely embellish something like perhaps he would exaggerate but it doesn't really make sense to me that he just completely exaggerate like this right and i always say there's a bit of truth in legends like even if they're severely exaggerated mm. they started from some bit of truth mm. so makes yeah, you wonder um, we certainly absolutely you know um we certainly have um accounts of um oh you're testing my memory now but i'm sure that i recall someone coming up with a mammoth shoulder blade bone or something coming up in a fishing net and thinking that it was part of um thinking that it was the shoulder blade of a giant ancient god and i think this was not even that long ago maybe a century or two so um you know you can only imagine how people thousands of years ago must have thought well yeah even during uh I can't remember it was the iguanodon if i remember correctly when they were first discovered it i think they they thought it was a tooth at first if i remember correctly but it turns out it was actually the thumb of the dinosaur oh um and that was recent it. yeah and that was recent uh within i think that the early 1900s is when they were because the early 1900s is i think when the bone wars was going on um don't quote me on that mm. but i do remember that that they they <laughs> When even in the more modern times, when they first discovered it, they uh, misplaced certain parts, and only through very mm-hmm. modern sciences they were able to figure out that they were wrong, um, because they were like, "This isn't oh. a tooth," you know, and it was something much different, <laughs> um, because they just have this weird, like, spiked thumb. Uh, but mm. yeah, may, you know, even back then, I can only imagine like what other what other things could they be misinterpreting? You know, how far, how much farther south? Um, for lack of a better term, would they be thinking, you know? Yeah, well, this is the thing, you know, um, science um, and archaeology are continuously evolving. It was only a couple of decades ago that archaeologists were convinced that slaves must have built, must have built the pyramids because they couldn't fathom that a normal working force would do this. And, you know, it's only been since we've discovered, discovered papyrus diaries um, detailing the movement of stone and looked at the biographies and the workers of the people who built the pyramids and all of this that we've actually come to the realization that no like these people were paid like quite well (laughs) you know like science and archaeology is continuously evolving as we learn new things yeah absolutely and just to correct myself for the viewers uh bone wars was from the uh, 1800s i think i said 1900s back then um dan why don't you go ahead and throw yourself in into the ring here so the main thing I'm kind of interested about is what the lay of the land would have been like back when he uh, supposedly discovered the quote unquote flying snakes. Was it uh, mm-hmm. desert like it was today or it is today? I assume it's a desert. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So was it? Yeah. Um, it... Definitely. Okay. Sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, definitely desert. Definitely desert still. Um, I've actually, this is, you know, also one of the things I looked at, um, you know, and how aware of the site might they have been. Um, a survey or an excavation has never been done at Wadi al Hitan to see how much Egyptian influence is in the area. So as far as, you know, um, hard evidence goes, I can't actually give you anything. I don't know. No one knows. Um, certainly within the area surrounding Wadi al Hitan, there are mines. 
and a couple of trade routes. So they were at the very least in the area. And in all honesty, I do find it difficult to believe that they were unaware of the site. Um, I don't, maybe it was something they avoided, which is why we haven't found anything so, you know, I mean, it must have been kind of scary to see these giant snake skeletons, you know? Mm -hmm. I was I was kind of thinking, um, this kind of ties into my second question, is do you know uh, when these skeletons are from? Like, is it, like, did you say earlier the Eocene? Yeah, the Eocene. The Eocene. So... Um, I remember watching some random YouTube video, and they used to talk about um, there is a species of whale that was carnivorous, so ate other whales or ate. Hmm. Is that what these are, or is this something else completely? There's definitely a, de a couple of different species. Hmm. Um, I don't go into paleontology too much, so I probably wouldn't feel comfortable giving you a definite answer there. Hmm. Um, but yeah, definitely between 56 to 33, 34 million years ago, um, different types of whale skeletons. So, um, I, I dare say that, I mean, my own observations, some of like the teeth on some of them is pretty sharp. So I, mm -hmm. I would, yeah, maybe, <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I'm definitely, it's definitely not my area of specialization. So I can't give you a definite on that. Okay. Fair enough. I think it's absolutely reasonable too to to consider that they may have avoided that area entirely. You know, somebody important from I'm not sure how they're. I guess you'll have a better grasp on this. So during this time period, what was their societal structure like in terms of governance? Uh, yeah, so you're looking at a period of about mm, three thousand years. <laughs> during which time um it did change considerably um you know um some some periods it was very stable and other periods it dissolved a little bit into an intermediate period which is um, you could loosely coin it as a dark age where things were not too good there were rulers from elsewhere that kind of came in um egypt was destabilized uh split into two that sort of thing um but yeah, it depends what era in particular you're looking at. Um, around the time Herodotus was coming in, uh, I'm pretty sure there was not really much Egyptian rule going on anymore. I think it was uh, within a century or two of Alexander coming and conquering. So I it, Egyptian rule was definitely declining at the very least. So uh, you're going to have to refresh my memory because... My my memory on Egyptian history is like extremely fuzzy. Um, mm -hmm. So there were there were there's a bunch of rulers. There are a bunch of emperors of Egypt who were native born Egyptians. And mm. uh, during the early years, there was a giant library constructed. Correct. Ooh, I know where Dane's going. Oh, uh, the library Continue. of Alexandria. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that was constructed, and then Egypt was invaded. And it was burnt down. Uh, that's right? right. Yeah, I think it was destroyed. Uh, yeah. This is um, I think it was during uh Caesar's reign that this happened. It was this the is largest. The end of Egyptian history. Oh, okay. It was the largest collection like, of books this... in the world, wasn't it? Or collection of knowledge? Uh, it was definitely one of the bigger ones. Uh, like for sure, there's a couple of other rulers that have had like giant libraries over the time. Like I think there was uh, an Akkadian ruler, or Assyrian, sorry, an Assyrian ruler who like really bragged about his giant library as well. Um, but yeah, it was it was definitely a big one. It was definitely a big one. Um, and it, yeah, if I am remembering rightly, it was um, Caesar accidentally burned a bunch of it down. So it was an accident. It wasn't uh, intentional. Uh, yeah, I don't recall it being on purpose. Um, but again, this is going like, oh, when, when was Caesar? So it's like definitely towards the, the turn of the millennium. Um, I, I specialize more in like Old Kingdom and mm -hmm. Middle Kingdom. So this is like a couple thousand years apart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I'm just it's a long period like of time. <laughs> I'm 
just trying to refresh my memory a and then b get like a a clear time time timeline time frame as to what i'm familiar mm. with man can you imagine yeah, if, yeah, that was, sure. if that library was still around what that would be amazing what it would hold like in terms of yeah. just information to like these mm. older civilizations like what kind of information those books would have held obviously oh, absolutely it's um mm. i was gonna say obviously like over time well that's the thing too is like without the without the rule continuing i doubt that library would have been maintained because these books deteriorate over time you know paper mites all kinds of other issues so they have to continuously maintain these books every you know several decades and they have to copy them over especially with those older more brittle types of paper that they used um i don't know what type uh, of paper I, they used. i dare say that these i dare say it would have been papyrus not paper at this stage which oh, okay. um, does last for quite a while so um they probably wouldn't have had that issue too much uh but yeah definitely maintaining everything is would <laughs> definitely be some poor soul's job right yeah no for sure but still like man i can only imagine like what would it what would that library tell us today if it was still here you know what information was lost mm. when it burned oh absolutely um there's there's so many things you know in archaeology that we know of we know that it's been destroyed or we know the roundabout area that it is but it's still missing and uh it's it's one of those things that gets to us on a daily basis i think it's the thing that actually keeps us all going is you know we go what if we find this today it's like even if you're digging at a site that's, you know, 500 kilometers away from where something was supposed to have been, you're like, oh, but we might find this. And so it's what keeps you going when you're digging out on a dusty, hot day in the middle of the Middle East. Right I mean, on. That sounds like a lot of fun. In it general, does, yeah. Obviously. It, it's one it of those depends what country you're in. <laughs> yeah. it, it's one of those experiences where when you're doing it, you don't want to be there. But then when you're not doing it, you kind of look back and you're like, oh, that was actually kind of fun. I wish I could do that again. Oh, you definitely want to be there. It's, okay. um, it's, it's like excavations are very fun. Mm -hmm. Um, generally when you're digging in the Middle East, you're done by lunchtime. So, um, you generally start digging at around 4 a.m. And you finish at midday because the sun gets so hot. Right. So you've still got the rest of the day to do anything. And, um, there is a, a bit of an alcoholism problem in archaeology, so um, they get pretty lit, is all I'm going to say. <laughs> Sounds awesome. I, I got to ask you, um, so we'll, we'll get into this whole topic. Um, we, we can, I kind of want to split away, go to this topic just for, um, just because I really want to get your take on it. Um, and then we can go back to, mm -hmm. uh, to a lot of the stuff that you're working on. But what is your take on the Mitchell Hedges skull. On the what, sorry? The Mitchell Hedges skull? The crystal skull? The crystal skull? You've never heard of the crystal skull? No, I need to look this up. Oh, man. <laughs> look up the Mitchell Hedges skull in particular. So... Alright, I'll have a look right now. Yeah. Uh, so this is Mesoamerican. This is why I've never heard of it. Yeah, this okay. was, uh, I think but this was this a South like... American discovery, I think, yeah. Yes. Right, right. Um, can I get back to you on this one? Because sure, Mesoamerican sure. Because archaeology is definitely not my forte. No, for sure, and, absolutely. Um, I... <laughs> when, when you said, like, Crystal Skull, I was, first, I, like, I haven't seen it, but I thought you were making a reference to Indiana Jones, and then I was thinking... <laughs> that is my you, you favorite. Meant, you meant, like... <laughs> Indiana Jones movie, Change My Mind. Just oh, kidding. Really? It's a, no, it's actually. The, I love the Temple of Doom too much. Yes, um, agreed. But <laughs> I'm I, actually a really bad archaeologist. I haven't seen any of them. <laughs> oh man, come on! You're killing me. Side note. I know. So you know that you know the archetype of like Indy, right? You know, like his generalized character in the movies. Yeah, I think so. Do you ever run into the people? With the gun and the hat. Yeah. Do you ever run into yes. people that are like? I am Indiana Jones. Yes. <laughs> yes. Is it like a cringe thing for you, or absolutely? <laughs> uh, it's it it depends. It's look look. I will never see someone dressed as something they love and go oh, but it's it's definitely a, how they present their character when they talk to you that kind of sometimes defines it for me. 
Okay, so, um, okay. Archaeology is one of those things that it definitely attracts the crazies. Mm-hmm. You know, like like it really does. And I remember having a professor when I was doing my bachelor um, saying, you know, um, my favorite part of teaching archaeology is trying to pick who the nutcase is in the class. And it's just, yeah, okay, I see that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it... Oh, I've, I've had one or two that have made me a little uncomfortable. <laughs> I'll say that much. <laughs> you don't have to go into details. It's just kind of like, I can't help I but imagine. I don't want to I can't help but imagine the, all the uh, Indiana Jones wannabes out there. Dude just walks up, pulls out it's a whip, um... and starts whipping pots open, like ancient pots that are like <laughs> super sacred, like discovery of a lifetime, just whips oh. the pot with a whip and is like, ah, there's no rupees in here. <laughs> that makes me cringe. Yeah, see? I think um, the the worst ones are probably um people that think they're Lara Croft or Nathan Drake or someone like that. That's They're really? probably a bit worse, to be honest. Yeah, like if if they're kind of like old enough to have watched Indiana Jones, generally they they've kind of outgrown that I'm gonna dress like Indiana Jones phase. Mm-hmm. Fair. I mean, to Fair. be honest, yeah. personally, I've never been a fan of Nathan Drake, but Laura, she's she's cool, but Indy's where it's at. <laughs> I love Laura Croft. <laughs> I'll have to go. <laughs> I'll have to do my research on Indiana Jones as well. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, definitely let me. I definitely will. Um, but yeah, definitely let me get back to you on these skulls. Um, I'll I'll have a look through. And, like, I won't be able to give you, obviously, the right. best, kind of. But I'll, I'll be able to give you something, at least. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. I guess for the viewers that aren't familiar with it, I'll kind of just give a synopsis of it. Um, so basically this archaeologist... Uh, brought his daughter with him on an expedition. I think she's like 11. Um, and she happened to discover a perfect human skull carved out of crystal quartz. And it was perfectly smooth. This was, I think, back in the... I want to say in the early 1900s. And um, I'm going to look that up real quick. 1924, yeah. 1924. And basically, it's this perfect like human skull and i think it was uh mayan and it was mayan ruins that they were exploring in and basically this skull for a long time really puzzled a lot of archaeologists and scientists i heard a lot of claims that basically with modern tools and even laser technology they weren't able to recreate it um <laughs> and like there there were details about it that were too perfect but then all these other crystal skulls started popping up and they were proven to be fakes. Like, very clearly they were being manufactured somewhere. Um, but the original Mitchell Hedges skull, I th- think, is still, like, a big question mark. But I'm, if I remember correctly, also the person who actually owns it now is very, like, I'm not going to let you test this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So that sounds about right. Yeah. So, but apparently it has been looked at a number of times by a very small select handful of people, and the just that I got, I could be interpreting this wrong, was that there were a lot of questions around it as to its origins and stuff. But mm. you know, I it, I think it is a lot of a Dane quote here. Prepare to put on your tinfoil hats. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but I really, I don't know, like the Crystal Skull one, like I would love to believe that these ancient civilizations managed to produce this weird, bizarre, perfectly edged, like no carving marks, perfect crystal skull without the technology, which would be fascinating. Like, how did they do it? You know, um, but mm. at the same time, just based on the whole scenario, it makes me wonder if it is faked. Um, by the way, Dane, okay, I kind of have to bring this up with the Mitchell Hedges skull. So the the daughter of the archaeologist that found it, right? Yes. She was in possession of it in modern times, uh, yes. early 2000s and such. But no, it is fascinating. So let me know your thoughts on that when you get a little more research on it. But uh, moving back to... Well, something... Go ahead. 
Oh, I can say something on it really quick, though, if yes. you want me to. Yes, go ahead. But it, it, like, again, it's more relating back to my field, but um, in regards to the whole, it's so perfect, how could the ancient people have done it, uh, that kind of chain of thought. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but there was a temple in Egypt that actually had to get moved because a dam was being built and it was going to be flooded. Uh, this is the temple of Abu Simbel that was built by Ramses II. And um, the temple was angled in such a way that I think it's about three days a year, the sun would shine directly down to the back of the temple and illuminate three god statues at the very end, except for the god of darkness, Ptah. And um, archaeologists and you know workers and all of this in, I think it was the 50s or so, said, okay, we're going to move this whole temple to a higher place so when the dam gets built, it doesn't flood it. And we're going to put it in the exact same angle so it does this exact same thing. And uh, with all of modern technology in the 50s, they got it wrong. And now the sun shines through at a different day. So, you know, there's sometimes we're not quite as accurate as ancient people are in some things. You never know. Right. I mean, like. What, are they, what else are you going to do, you know, with your time other than eat fucking dirt? Like, you might as well master a skill, like, some kind of fucking <laughs> epic carpentry shit, you know? Like, might as well do that, exactly. but sit around all day, you know? Like, these guys literally spent every day of their lives, probably since they were old enough to hold a tool, like, 10 years old, working on these, like... Mm. Like, you look at some of the... Uh, Younger. Architecture. Yeah, like, the architecture that some of these people are capable of, like, very advanced stuff. Mm. Makes you think, like... Yeah. You know, we spend a few years of our adult life working towards that stuff. Imagine somebody that spent every day, 365, seven days a week, since they were, like, eight, working on, like, some mm, type of very younger. specialized skill. Yeah. Imagine what they're capable of is, is, you know, I mean, human beings aren't stupid, you know, as as stupid mm. as some people may be today, you know, but whatever um <laughs> you know like i like some of those guys man like they did some really impressive work you know, really impressive things oh yeah absolutely and you know as soon as you're old enough to do you're right like as soon as you're old enough to do anything it's okay off to work now we've got um a couple uh one city in particular built by arkanaten in the new kingdom and we've found you know a cemetery filled with children's bodies and it's like okay that's a bit strange why have all these kids died so young? And they've all got injuries that are, you know, they've they've been working, and some of them are as young as four. Oh my god! You know, they've been, they've been working to build this city. Question: How the hell do you move a temple? I have no idea. <laughs> With a lot of hard work. <laughs> dude, aliens, <laughs> aliens, bro. Aliens. You, yeah, dude, you get that alien tech, bro. Once they dug that stuff up, man, they were ready to go. They were like, all right, now we can move temples and shit overnight. Man, this is awesome. All right, let's get into the hypothetical no, thing. <laughs> is it... They disassembled it, like, piece by yeah. piece. <laughs> okay, okay, that's what I was thinking, but, like... Yeah. I, I just kind of <laughs> had, like, a cartoon there. playing in my head where they just all pick up the temple and walk it over there <laughs> to wherever they're going to go. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a four-man lift. Yeah, lift with your yeah. back, you know? <laughs> Jerk in a twisting Benjamin. motion with your back, yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, here I got a question for you. So, what is mm -hmm. you know, conspiracy theories aside, like doesn't have to be anywhere in relevant uh, relevance to that. What is the most mm -hmm. bizarre thing that is unexplained that you've come across uh, or heard of in your line of work? Oh. This is an interesting one. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is probably the Antikythera mechanism, um, which is, uh, I actually had the privilege of um, working on Kithara in Greece. Uh, and it's basically, there's a shipwreck between Kithara and Antikythera, these two islands. And uh, archaeologists found a shipwreck and went down and you know performed an underwater excavation. And they came up with this thing that You, the only way you can really describe it uh, is like our ancient computer, really. It's, um, we think it may have been used for charting stars. Uh, it's definitely the only one of its kind we've ever found. 
I think there was a hypothesis on someone who made it, who was well known to be a bit of an inventor back then. Um, but yeah, we, it, it just looks like a pile of rusted gears. It's really, that's quite bizarre to me. Um, in terms of Egyptian archaeology, uh, we do have something called reserve heads, which have been found in a lot of old kingdom tombs. And basically, um, a lot of kings, um, you know, a lot of obviously kings would build statues of themselves. And for some reason, um, a lot of them chose to just make a couple of extra heads just in case. Don't know. Weird. Don't know what the purpose of the reserve heads are. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we can probably hypothesize a little bit with those ones, but uh, the Antikythera mechanism, uh, no idea. Sounds fascinating. So just just to be a little mm. bit more specific, the reserved heads are for the statues and not for themselves, right? I'm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to be completely honest, like um, this is the thing as well. Um, mummification was more than just preserving the body and building statues were more than just glorifying the person who built them um statues were literally intended to be a replacement for the body in case the body was destroyed um which oh. is often why you know a lot of people notice that statues have got noses and eyes and ears and that sort of thing carved off and you know we can hypothesize a little bit that this might have been a bit of an attack so that um if someone's i'm going to use the word spirit i suppose it's not quite correct but if someone's spirit came back from the afterlife and inhabited the statue, they wouldn't be able to see, smell, hear, that sort of thing. Mm. So um, there's a possibility in my head that the reserve heads were built in case someone defaced one of the statues and they needed to come back and inhabit the statue and they couldn't see, hear, smell, that sort of thing. That makes sense. Okay. But it's definitely a bit weird. Yeah, it's it's a whole thing. Like, um, oh, we found some creepy tombs in like real like mummy shit you know like the movie the mummy like just mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um in regards to the whole defacing of the body um but yeah that's I, I don't know whether they were intended for the mummy or for the statue i'm assuming for the statue but i can't say for sure mm. i i don't know because i want to get into some some more uh We'll call it spooky territory. But mm. I have the understanding <laughs> that as, as an archaeologist and a person of like, you know, fact, it's not your biggest um it's not your biggest it's not it's not something that you really, really like, you know, get into because it's a bit taboo. At least Are you opinion. serious? Are you kidding me, dude? Dude, archaeology is spooky as fuck. No, I mean like, like I all get about, about on the site. <laughs> All the spirits and ghosts <laughs> in the reincarnation, you know, level of spooky. Not, uh, mm, no, not not necessarily. Um, you know, we we all are inclined to believe the facts that we see in front of us, but that doesn't mean to, that doesn't suggest at all that some of us aren't spiritual. Um, mm -hmm. a very funny contradiction I've met is um, you know, I I know a lot of archaeologists that work in biblical archaeology, and they're profound Christians and you know they're dealing with stuff every day that completely contradicts what they believe um but you know they sort of just and, and I've asked them about this you know like how do you deal with that and they say that they sort of just separate it in their minds archaeology is different from their belief kind of thing um mm. so no we, we definitely deal with stuff um that's some of us would definitely consider spooky like for sure like, can you give us a absolutely. story or would that give away too much um, like a personal story or Yeah, yeah. Or maybe one that you've heard. Yeah, I can I can do both if you want. Um personally, um I've probably got two that mm, so uh my first is probably um I was in Turkey and I was walking through um an old site and, and I was just I was I wasn't there excavating I was just there you know exploring for myself and I'd, I'd gone on a tour so I could get around easy and they sort of said to us okay um so you'll have enough time to explore all this um but don't go over there if you go towards the north gate you'll end up in the cemetery and that's too far and we don't want you over there so it's like okay sure 
so I'm kind of, you know, walking through all the ancient ruins um, before everyone else because they all went to the gift shop and I wanted to look at the ruins. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of walking around and I'm, I'm looking at the ground and at the, um, the pavement um, that's been built, you know, this ancient road. And I'm thinking, you know, wow, someone put down this road thousands of years ago. This is amazing. And, you know, just being a complete nerd about this fucking road. And um, all of a sudden I had this really odd feeling. Like, um, oh, I've never experienced anything like it since. It was, it was like all of the hairs on my neck stood up. I got goosebumps. And I had this insane feeling that I should just not be where I am. Like, and I just needed to leave. And I was like, what the hell is going on? So I've, I've looked up and um, I'm thinking, oh, shit, the architecture's changed. What's, what's going on here? And um, I'm looking at the thing closest to me and I'm, trying to figure out what it is and I'm, and then it's kind of occurred to me like oh that's an ossuary and then I've like looked a little bit to the side and oh shit that's an above ground crypt and then I realized that I'd gone I'd walked all the way to the north gate and I was in this above ground cemetery with all the and like some of them were cracked and open and I could see inside them and I was just like oh crap okay um and like it wasn't a feeling like I was in danger it was just a you're somewhere you shouldn't be please leave sort of thing so I just kind of turned around and left and <laughs> like, sorry, didn't mean to wake you up. Um, when you started, but uh, yeah, that's when, when, sorry? when you started, um, you said that the instructor or the guide said, don't go to the north part where the cemetery is. And the first thing that comes to my mind is <laughs> that's exactly where I'm going to go. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me. Right. Like, <laughs> and, like, I was feeling a little rebellious. Like I didn't. I, I'm not going to lie. I did intend to go there. It's not blocked off. They were just like, you don't have time. It's too far away. Um, but yeah, I always intended to go there. I just didn't kind of expect to accidentally go there. Yeah. So, yeah, I, but that was, um, that was interesting. It was really just a, not a you're in danger, just a, you know, you shouldn't be here. Please move along sort of. Um, but it was a very spooky feeling, if mm. that's the right word for it. Eerie. Like, it was unsettling. Yeah, eerie. That's yeah, eerie. It was eerie, really eerie. Like it was almost like the only thing I could hear was the wind. Um, and you know, it's a crowded tourist site. I couldn't hear anyone talking anymore. All I could hear is just the wind, like whistling through these crypts. And it was just like, yeah, it was really spooky. Yeah, that's really gonna eerie. Put you on edge a little bit. That, that sounds like fun, though. I will say, it sounds like a lot of fun. Well, Dane, it was one of my fun memories. But <laughs> Dane, the explanation to what she was feeling isn't it obvious? It's a cloud. Ghost. It's a cloud, bro. It's a cloud. It's a cloud, bro. It's a cloud, bro. Nah, dude, it's just a cloud. It was UFOs. Cloud. You know what? Hands down. Cloud. Uh, <laughs> nah, <laughs> it's, it's an inside joke between us. The, the, the cloud. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, in terms of like spooky stories I've heard, um. There's a real classic one that comes out of Egypt. Um, the Egyptians had this uh, this thing where occasionally they'd um, put precious stones or gold or whatever on a statue. And um, this particular tomb owner, had just, him and his wife had decided to make statues of themselves with, oh, I can't remember what exactly they made the eyes out of, but it was some kind of precious stone, and uh, which, you know, is reflective. And... Um, they've put them facing the entrance to the tomb. So one day, this poor archaeologist, and this probably not even an archaeologist, probably this poor just Egyptian worker, has dug down, um, found the entrance, entrance of this tomb and looked in, and he shined his flashlight in, and the flash the flashlight's reflected off the glass eyes. So he's just seen these two eyes looking back at him, and the poor guy nearly had a heart attack. Just <laughs> freaked out. So... <laughs> So yeah, no, we get spooky. We definitely get spooky. <laughs> I, I think that's just that's just a funny one. I like that. <laughs> it wasn't for him. I'm pretty sure he just quit. He's like, no, that's that's I'm done. <laughs> I've got a go ahead, Dane. Oh, go ahead, Zach. Yeah. All right, I guess I'll throw mine in the ring. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what are you? What do you know about the elongated skulls? some of the ancient egyptians you know the where they elongated their skulls do you know what a lot of the 
why they were doing I know it was to honor the gods, so to speak, but do you know where that kind of originated from and why they were doing that? I don't think the Egyptians really did that, actually. Oh, were they not? I might be thinking of a different civilization entirely. I know there's some that were doing it, and I'm not really sure why. It's always puzzled me. Yeah, like, I'm Why are they to, doing that? I'm trying to think. Um... Hmm. I mean, I mean, look, it, look, it wasn't. It definitely wasn't common. Right. You know, like in in, in Egypt at least. Um. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Like I know in Africa, there's a lot of one. like, in Africa, even in modern tribes, there's a lot of body deformation, like where they just like weirdly mm. manipulate and do these weird things with their bodies and weird piercings and stuff like and i'm talking like the weird like lip yeah. piercings where they like do all this weird stuff with their <laughs> lips and they do um, gauges in their lips right or the yeah or the elongated necks right i've seen that yeah but do you find this do you really find this so strange though no i mean if you look at modern society you know we have people that put stretches in their ears and stretch out their ears we have people that have nose piercings lip piercings belly button piercings penis piercings like <laughs> all sorts of crazy stuff you know yeah. um we have people that tattoo their entire body um you people know, that um, cut their tongue in half people... to look like a snake like yeah like yeah, you know it's a good people point. have been doing this forever like forever and it's, it's you know sometimes it's a very individual thing mm -hmm. um, yeah it very well could be I, I, yeah i, I can't I, I haven't come across any elongated skulls in Egypt myself. Okay. Um, and I and I definitely haven't heard of it as being common practice. So, if we do find any, I dare say they would probably have influence from another culture. Okay. Yeah. No, it's entirely possible. Like, I guess, I guess we can kind of go that route. Like, especially if you're like smaller tribes that are more um mm. more focused, I guess, so to speak. If your leader or whatever is doing some weird body stuff, like elongating his skull and stuff because he ate the wrong berry bush and had a fucking acid trip, you know, <laughs> and is like, I saw the gods, they have elongated skulls and then started doing this weird shit to his head, you know? And then everyone's like, oh my God, like our king master leader hunter man saw, you know, king Peruvian sun god, we must elongate our skulls as well or they will kill us. And then they all went and ate the same acid trip and berries, you know. So I guess, you know, I think there there could be a, a very logical explanation to that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So. And yeah, like I'm, drugs I'm glad... across like ancient cultures is something I've always wanted to study, like in more depth. I've just never had the time. <laughs> Man, dude, some of those dudes in, like, South America, some of those cactuses out there are nuts. Like, those tropical cactuses, oh, really? like, they, like the flower buds and stuff on there will make you fucking trip balls, man. This is relevant to ancient Egypt, specifically. Does, okay, <laughs> does, <laughs> does the Tree of Life ring a bell? Do you know what that is? Uh, like, Yggdrasil? Uh, the um, acacia tree. So the tree of life in ancient Egypt, which oh, apparently okay. had so sorry. I, but... Does it? Does it yeah. really? I, I think that's, that's really what... interesting. So they used to do their own form of ayahuasca, and ayahuasca is a uh, South American shamanistic, you know, like dr not a drug. It makes you see shit. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, really. I'm... I remember learning recently, like within the past five months, that ancient Egyptians used to do the same thing with their with their own version, and they used it as like a, a shamanistic ritual to see whatever it is that they want to see. Do you know anything about that? Actually, don't. I, the acacia tree was definitely important. Um, like uh, I think Hathor was often attributed to the acacia tree. Um, but I, yeah, I. Like I was saying, you know, um, looking at drugs in ancient cultures is something I've really been interested in studying um, because it, it really is something I don't know much about. Um, I haven't heard of this either. Um, so I'd be interested to do my own research into this as well because this is, yeah, this isn't something I know about. Uh, I 
think it's. Uh, and that's not to say, by by the way, that 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 means it doesn't exist. Like my knowledge is yeah. by no means um omniscient, but um yeah, that's quite interesting. So you do want to look into is the blood of Osiris. The blood of Osiris. Yes. If, okay. If that's the route you want to go. Is the like psychedelic nature of, uh, or the psychedelic uh, teachings. I don't know the proper word for it. Nature, teachings, uh, tendencies, habits of ancient Egyptians. Hmm. Okay. This is. I've just like done a quick Google search right now because I'm because I'm quite curious about this. Um. This is definitely new to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I thought that ayahuasca was just something that people in South America use for a very long time, but you know. Like I said, the past few months, I um, came across a video that talked about how ancient Egyptians used to do the same thing. Hmm. Yeah, this this might need to be something I'll get back to you on as well, because I've never heard of anything like this. Mm -hmm. Like, this is really new to me. Um, and again, not, not meaning that that necessarily means it's inaccurate or of course. anything. Um. But yeah, I'm not the only website I found so far in my, you know, very quick Google search is one that I don't trust too much. <laughs> but um yeah, let me let me get back to you on this one as well, because I, I don't wanna like dismiss it entirely. It sounds interesting. I mean, I, I, I personally find like psychedelics throughout history to be very fascinating. Um I've talked about it mm. before, but I've had my own psychedelic experiences and watching worlds fold into themselves and um i forget what they call it oh, but there's a there's a snake a giant snake maybe not giant but a snake that's associated with um ayahuasca and dmt which i saw myself and it's not just like you know that just me that's seen it it's something that many people have seen so it, a i giant find it kind of yes uh, i can look it up for you now this is um, that's actually because because this kind of brings back to a couple of things that I was thinking about um mentioning earlier in regards to this um you know the mythical snake skeletons um <laughs> there's um if you don't mind me tying it in that is um Go ahead. Go ahead. there's you know another thing I was going to mention in regards to talking about the Eocene skeletons from earlier is um. There's this ancient Egyptian story that I, I just adore, um, known as the Shipwrecked Sailor. And it's basically about this sailor who his ship capsizes and he ends up on this strange island, which has got, it's like a paradise. It's got everything he could ever want to eat, you know, drink, all of that sort of thing. And it's inhabited by a giant snake. And this giant snake comes up to him and it's, um, it's benevolent. It's a nice snake, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting by Egyptian standards as it is because they were not fond of snakes. Um, like, like at all, dude. Like, there are depictions of the underworld where there's like snakes with wings, snakes with knives, like all sorts of mm -hmm. bullshit. <laughs> like, snakes. They hated snakes. Why do I have to be snakes? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so like, it's interesting to see a snake portrayed in a benevolent way. And um, this snake tells a story about his, his origins, where he says, you know, I used to live on this island with my family. Um, he gives a number, like 52 of them or something like this. And he said, then a star fell and the star killed everyone. It burnt up their bodies. And I was the only one to survive because I was like away at the time. So like, I often wondered if this tied in with the Eocene skeletons, if, you know, the Egyptians had seen these skeletons and been like, wow. How did they come about? And they've made up this story like, oh, there's a star fell from the sky and blew up all these snakes. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting when you talk about the whole DMT thing, you know, maybe someone saw all the whale skeletons and then was tripping out and saw a giant snake too and was like, oh, this is what's happened. Well, yeah, it's very possible. I actually, uh, I think that a lot of the things that people used to believe in what leads to people believing today is a result of them taking a psychedelic mushroom or having like some form of DMT ingested. 
and they saw something mm, that they can't explain, they can't understand, and they interpret it in a certain way, and that becomes, you know, I might get hate for this, but a religion or, you know, like... <laughs> Well, no, I, I think you. I think you're correct. You know, like um, in the absence of science, you know, humans have always had this habit of wanting to understand things. So when they can't explain something, they will make up a reason for why things are. You know, um, if there's lightning in the sky, oh god, it's yeah. Like if if they if lightning crashes through the sky, it's not oh that's like static electricity. That's um, oh it must be the gods laughing. You know, stuff like that, or the gods are angry. It's the only way to explain something sometimes. Yeah, I mean, just to take a personal experience and like project it and put myself in that mindset of I'm someone way back when. Um, I, I I had taken acid um, given to me <laughs> by my mom. Uh, thank God I had someone there to, <laughs> to comfort me. Yeah, my, my family's into like ayahuasca and stuff. So welcome to America. Yeah, welcome to America. <laughs> Um, oh my god <laughs> um, so i had three main visions and i'm gonna call them visions the first of which mm-hmm. was i was laying there had my eyes closed and the background was white and there was a giant black centipede crawling and i didn't feel very comfortable about that and i could feel it biting the side of my face but actually I that was just a fan so I would have interpreted so putting myself in that mindset, I could have interpreted it as like a demon or maybe hell or something. And then the one that followed that a little bit later was the giant snake. And it was very peaceful. It was like, you know, the giant snake's flickering along and then everything else behind it was just a bunch of more smaller green snakes and stuff like that. And then the final vision was Earth, like me staring at Earth. And it formed the shape of a heart, and then it started folding into itself. So maybe we take that, and that is now heaven and hell fighting each other. So the snake and the centipede, you know? Hmm. That's kind of beautiful. So, I mean, I I completely understand why people would mistake that for, or maybe interpret that uh, Hmm. into a religious belief. Yeah, absolutely. Man, this is such a good episode. Just saying, <laughs> I don't recommend you take any psychedelics unless you're <laughs> in the correct set and setting. This goes for everyone in this chat and everyone else. Because <laughs> like, even thinking back on it, it's kind of difficult. It gives me a little bit of anxiety because it was not a pleasant experience and it lasted for 12 hours. So it was like, oh, eh. fuck. 12 dude. hours. Yes, 12 hours. All I, I wanted that. to do was go to sleep. Holy shit. That's all I wanted. All right. Oh, I, oh I got to tell my psych- psychedelic oh, story, that my one psychedelic story now. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not into, like, the psychedelics or any of that kind of stuff. Um, how old was I? I think I, was, I had just turned 18 when I tried this. So um, there's a drug here in the U.S. This one's actually legal, too. Is It's called Salvia. Oh. Um. Yeah, I took salvia, and salvia is a hallucinogen. <laughs> hey, man, this is Alex. Alex, if you hear this, uh, this was your idea, and it was actually not a bad trip at all. I actually had a really good time. Um. So, <laughs> basically, he suggested that when I turned eighteen, I should, you know, try it and just kind of do it for the experience, you know. And I um. So I agreed, and we went to a smoke shop. Basically, you just smoke it. Um, you get a little, you know, bong. You burn it. And you 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 inhale it, and uh, it's a hallucinogen. But he said what was really important is you have to like put your mindset in the right place. Otherwise, you're gonna hmm. lose it. Like you're gonna go nuts. The trip only lasts for a couple minutes, if that. So we got some, and part of the process of doing it was you know you got to put yourself in the good mood so you don't have a bad trip and start hallucinating like all this crazy stuff uh you put on some music that you really enjoy that's really mellow kind of puts you in the right mood and so i put on crystallized by lindsey sterling one of my all-time favorite songs and um (laughs) i smoked uh i smoked some 
kind of sat there for a minute or a couple seconds, didn't really feel anything. And just fucking like a light switch went off. I was floating in space. And then Lindsey Sterling was there in space playing the violin to the song that I was listening to. And that's pretty much what that was the entire trip was that experience right there. By the way, Lindsey Sterling, uh, if you ever hear this, please come hang out with us. We'll watch UFO videos and, <laughs> you know, we'll hang out. But uh, regardless, um, yeah, no, it was, a, it was a really interesting experience. And when it comes to hallucinations, I all, the reason that I wanted to bring this up was when it comes to hallucinations, the human brain, like, you can think of millions of things to think about or see or, you know, there's so many infinite possibilities for that. In certain instances where people are hallucinating the same exact thing over very long periods of time makes me wonder why. You know, mm. whether it's, you know, spooky tinfoil hat or, or something other otherwise, what, what the biological factor might be, whatever it is. It really makes me wonder why are people seeing... This is something we go into with sleep paralysis a lot, is people see the same thing over and over again and we don't know why. We know people hallucinate, but why are they seeing the same thing? Is weird. Um, is is it merely really makes me wonder. It's funny that you say this, um, because I, I agree. It does make me wonder if people's brains are wired a similar way, because we do see, you know, in archaeology and ancient history, um, a lot of very similar mythologies turn up all of the time. Like, for example, almost every society has a flood story. And it's like, why? Almost every society has some kind of dragon. That's a good point. There's a lot of similar similarities. Mm. A lot of societies have seen the night hag. The what? The night hag. I'll go into that after. Sorry, finish. <laughs> no, I, I want to know about this now. <laughs> okay. So I, I've talked about this almost every episode. Stackhouse knows. <laughs> I really like it. It's another personal experience, but it's also something people have been seeing, and it's been recorded since the 1300s. And it's basically okay. the term night hag, or the term nightmare comes from night hag. If, okay. Uh, if I'm 100% correct, I, I, don't, I take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, because, you know, mm -hmm. obviously there are other, other origins that it could be coming from. Um, it's basically... What is described as a older woman who is sitting on your chest, and she is either directly over you, or maybe she is putting her feet in your face, or maybe she's just sitting on the edge of your bed. But when you experience sleep paralysis, this is something that many, 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 many people have seen. And then on top of that, you gotta be the one in a million that sees the night hag when you, know, you could just as well see the quote-unquote hat man or you could see like the bugs wait the what the hat yeah so the oh my god you guys have to tell me what the hell a hat man is the hat man is basically a tall black figure with a hat that stands somewhere in your room or in your doorway uh when you <laughs> Yeah, what and the like, hell? I want to see the hat man. That sounds amazing. Yeah, there's <laughs> illustrations of it, and uh, for some reason, man, people are seeing these same two figures: the the night hag and the the man with the hat. And no one really seems to understand why everyone's seeing this thing. We've we've gone quite off topic, but I had two more questions for you that I'd <laughs> like to at least get through. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'm not sure. I, I, if I remember correctly, this isn't really a thing. It's more of like a Hollywood thing, but booby traps okay. in ancient Egypt uh, and people running into them. Yes, this is a good question, actually. I do like this question. Um, so you're right. Absolutely not nearly as common as what you think, mm -hmm. like at all. It's um, actually... It does delve into my interests quite a little bit, actually, though, because I did do um, a thesis on curses, um, which mm. seems to be more the kind of booby trap that actually happened, if that makes sense. Um, most tombs were actually open to the public, 
they were it was kind of like expected that you would go into a tomb pay your respect your respects rather um leave some food leave some water leave, burn some incense um so tombs weren't really something to be avoided unless you were like you know the king mm -hmm. um in which case you know they were pretty elaborate tombs some of them are so deep that we haven't even finished digging them out yet like crazy shit like that um but yeah um curses were very common like really common booby traps not at all very rare really yep can you um can you give me an example because you said very rare so that implies at least to me that there are cases of booby traps can you recall any or is that just like some knowledge that you have oh uh, yeah look um look i won't i don't know if it was intended as a booby trap which is more why i say rare what yeah. is common is a shaft tomb so basically there would be a room where um you know there sometimes there was a decoy sarcophagus and sometimes it was just like a shrine and then we found a hole in like the corner of the tomb or something and once you go down this shaft which is you know quite deep in a lot of cases several meters um the actual sarcophagus is down there so it's kind of hidden away from tomb robbers mm -hmm. and that sort of thing but um it wasn't really intended i mean if you just jumped down there you'd probably break your leg but um it wasn't it was more of a deterrent than a booby trap yeah if that makes sense so no, no, like spikes coming out of the wall and impaling people. Or, <laughs> no running. Uh, I think like... Right, no stepping on the wrong stone uh, and everything goes to shit. Yeah. Dude, do you know how high my job would pay if there were booby traps? Like, uh, we man, you gotta get that. Pay. Yeah, the hazard pay. I was gonna say. <laughs> I wish the only thing of a booby trap I can think of that I know of is um the tomb of the first emperor of china and again i wouldn't really say it's a booby trap um but his tomb is actually covered in liquid mercury so we actually don't have the means to excavate it yet so uh, we're actually holding off excavating that for now because we don't know how to do it safely for us yeah i don't think you want to take a bath in no <laughs> not at all but uh, yeah, in terms of um, traps and stuff, I'm sorry, that's the best I got. I mean, it's kind of disappointing, but it's it's what I expect. <laughs> mm, it's um, but you know what though, um, history is being made every day. It's not too late for you to build a trap into your own tomb. Ah, uh, that you know what, you're right. Mm -hmm. Maybe the ancient Egyptians didn't do it, but. Uh, modern Americans will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know um, a couple of friends of mine. I have a pact with one of my friends that if she dies first, I'll mummify her. Um, oh, really? And uh, yeah, and she wants to be buried um, in an underground pyramid to confuse future archaeologists. So that would be awesome, actually. Uh, it'll be fun. <laughs> um. Is My it last... bad that I'm hoping she dies first? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, it, it depends on I'm your... I'm a bad friend. On, ...on who you are as a person. To me, I mean, jokingly, no. <laughs> <laughs> no I'm not quite that bad of a friend. <laughs> So my my other question, which may be, which may be a little bit more uh, complex for you to answer... Mm -hmm. Or yeah, maybe sure. you just don't want to answer it at all, um, which is why okay. it's kind of like two two options here. How how did a either you or b someone in general get into your field? Um, into this field? Did you say sorry? Yes, I mean archaeology in general, but maybe you want to apply it to your situation specifically, or just in general. Right. Um. Um, I'm not sure how it goes in America. Um, what I have heard is that it's a lot more difficult to get into in America. And a lot, and I know that, you know, from what I've, at least what I've heard, um, university is very expensive for you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, where I'm from in Australia, um, archaeology is actually relatively common. Um, 
you know, gen if uh, the government or somebody wants to build a house or lay pipes or anything like that, um, an archaeologist has to go through first and clear it and make and say that um, it's culturally inert, basically. So um, there's no Aboriginal artifacts or anything there. It's not a place of significance before anyone can dig. Mm -hmm. so, Man, um, that sounds like commercial... actually good. Like, that sounds like they're re really making use. <laughs> Meanwhile, over here in America, you spend a hundred thousand dollars and you get a degree in uh, ancient hamburger digging up shit. You know, <laughs> like not to not to actually shit on the American archaeologists. Oh. I'm sure they actually do do important work, but no, you're right. Uh, university here is very very expensive. 20k a year for something. Yeah. Yeah, it's insane. Oh, see, that's like. That's like what my whole bachelor cost. Really? And um, oh my God. for us, yeah. And for us, we don't have to pay it up front. We have a system called HEX, which basically means that um, it goes into a debt, um, but there's no interest on the debt. And it comes out of our taxes when we do get a job that pays over a certain amount of money. So it's, um, we don't really even notice it being what? paid off too much. Commercial archaeology is pretty common. In Australia, so um, I don't want to go so far as to say there will always be jobs, but there's often work. If it, it basically, as long as someone's building something, there'll be work. Mm -hmm. Um, I got into it. Uh, I've I've always had an interest in history. It's um, kind of. I can't tell you where it started because, like I said, I never watched Indiana Jones or anything like that when I was a kid. It's kind of just always been there. Um, my mum used to get really shitty with me when I was a kid because I used to go through the paddock and dig up hole and dig holes looking for, you know, treasure and that sort of thing. And um, she'd yell at me, ah, the horses are gonna fall in the holes. You gotta, you, you can kind of dig a hole at least to like, you know, fill it back in. Um, so I think they got me like a metal detector when I was six to stop me. Like they said, only dig a hole if the beep goes off. So that stops me digging holes for a while. Um, because there are no beeps. But yeah, um, because <laughs> there are no beeps. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, you know, I finished high school and I took a couple of years to travel and kind of find myself. And um, just I didn't want to go into university without having an idea of what I wanted to do, and I didn't want to do something that was gonna be boring for me. You know, like um, if I wanted to get rich quick, I could have gone into banking or something like that. I, I, eh. I don't really care for that sort of thing. I just wanted to be happy. So um, I took a long time to think about it. Um, and it became very clear as I took a couple of gap years that history was really my passion and that I really loved archaeology. Um, so, yeah, I got home and applied interstate to go to a university that was really good in Egyptian archaeology. And uh, I got in. So I moved and said bye to my family. <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, I've lived there ever since. And um, I completed my bachelor, master's, all of that. And um, yeah, I got a lot of opportunities while I was at university to travel and excavate overseas. Um, a lot of opportunities to work on Egyptian tombs and that sort of thing while I was still in university. Um, I even... Um, I even actually got to work on um, Assassin's Creed Origins with the hieroglyphs, which is pretty cool. Really? Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were um, doing a project, which I think they're still doing, called the Hieroglyphs Initiative, where they have a, a very ambitious project to, um, to basically build a computer that will translate hieroglyphs. And, like, I, 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 mean, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm not so good with coding or anything like that. I'm... I will be insanely impressed if they can pull it off because Egyptian grammar is fucked. Like, it's fucked. Really? Like, of all the languages I've learned, it's fucked. Like, <laughs> so I'll be super impressed if they can pull it off. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think they're still doing it. But um, yeah, I helped with that a little bit, which was really fun. And um, yeah, I've helped digitizing some tombs, um, you know, as, um, as science progresses, so must archaeology, so... Um, and one of the biggest issues we have in archaeology is that, you know, we have these decrepit old archaeologists that publish everything on paper and they lose all their data because everything's written on paper. Um, they've got no backups. So if they have a fire or they spill water on something, it's just gone. And um, 
you know, archaeology is, is destruction. Once something's been dug up, you can't redig it and to refine evidence and how it's positioned and all of this sort of thing. So it's really valuable data that's gone. Um, so I was involved in a project that's um, revolved around basically digitizing some tombs so that um, anyone anywhere in the world can access them and um, have an explanation of what they are, um, what the hieroglyphs say, and all of that. So yeah, um, sorry, that was very long-winded. Um, but that's my little story. <laughs> you know, I, I have nothing but but props for you because what you do is amazing. Respect. Well, I worked hard to get here. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And you deserved it. So. Yeah, but like to you guys too, though. You know, like um, from like what you were telling me earlier before the chat started, like you guys are going hard too. Like, well done. And you know, in the system that you guys have with university, like holy shit. <laughs> Like, props to you guys, too. Like, damn. Me, me neither me or Dane. Like, student debt. Yeah, me and Dane were, um, neither him or I went to university, luckily. Yeah. So we have did, no uh, overhanging debt. Oh. Yeah. I did community college for yeah. a couple of months trying to learn Japanese, but that's, about <laughs> <laughs> that's the extent of it. Yeah. Fucking Dane. But, like, this is, <laughs> but this is my point as well, though, you know, like, I had the opportunity to do it with no debt, whereas I, I imagine for you guys, that's a very serious discussion you would have had to have with yourself. Yeah, no, I'm glad you got a good education yeah. and you were able to really, you know, make use of it out there and that it really did serve you well. And, you know, you're very knowledgeable based on the time that we've spent together in the last couple hours. Um, so it's really, really oh, cool I to hear you. To learn. <laughs> that's, that's, that's one of the things that I always yeah. have a lot of respect for is like, you know, you're, you're, the real reality of it is you're never going to know everything about anything, you know. No, um, absolutely not. And that's what, makes, that's what makes the field fun, you know, is, is always being able to try and discover new things. That's what makes things interesting, at least mm. to me. So. Yeah, 100%. Also, uh, I think that yeah. kind of wraps it up pretty much if, you, if you're good with that, Dane. Yeah. Are you, what about you, Kay? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Um, thanks for having me on. I had a lot of fun. 